there's so much to say. Uh, the work that Ian has done has had such an impact on my professional and personal life. Uh, I came to New York um, just as the Palladium was opening. I miss studio, but I've been reporting on writing about Ian's projects uh, for nearly two decades now. Um, more than, oh God, anyway. Uh, a lot, I, I don't want to do the math. Um, but it's a storied career that I'm just going to breeze through really quickly that begins with uh, a nightclub that defined a moment in history. And many of Ian's projects define specific moments in popular culture, in design. These are landmark projects that had enormous influence. As I said, I was... I was never there, but I would have enjoyed it all. The cocaine, the ladies, I would have. Uh, that, however, is the Palladium. And uh, that was the first summer I went to New York. And it was something that New York had never seen. It was this grand vision of a modern entertainment that on the scale of a Radio City music hall, of a Moulin Rouge, of these great, incredible creations of visionary, um, directors, designers, putting together something to show the world a new face. And the collection of designers, this was the um, vertiginous staircase uh, that I stumbled down many an evening, <laughs> um, having had too much, uh, for the sake of this conversation, alcohol. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it brought together designers architects and artists in a way that was completely revolutionary. So it tapped into the art uh, scene of the 1980s that was so incredibly vibrant with Francesco Clemente and Julian Schnabel and uh, transforming this old theater into something that was so startlingly modern. Arata Isozaki, who you know from uh, MoCA downtown, but sort of launched into the world's consciousness through, through this nightclub. Um, from there, Ian went to hotels. And his first hotel was Morgan's. And this was a, 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 a high water, not a high water mark, what am I trying to say? A milestone in the history of hospitality development. It was a hotel that had an attitude. It had, it, it had a point of view both in its design and how it welcomed visitors. And uh, Ian worked on it with Andre Putman, who I still believe is the most glamorous woman I've ever met. From there, the Royalton, which, you know, uh, late 80s, early 90s, was the place. And once again, it was a whole other vision, something that people had never seen, and it uh, marked the inauguration of an incredibly fruitful collaboration with Philippe Stark. I wish it was still like this today. And from there, the Paramount, which was a much larger, much, you know, uh, uh, rooms for uh, lower budget travelers. And it too was a vision of something that we really hadn't seen. I show this slide, just the prescience of this man, and um, I can't imagine what he bought that uh, Mark knew some chaise for, uh, probably, I don't know, 10,000 maybe? These things that are going at Christie's and Sotheby's now for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so this vision was more, as I said, it wasn't just like some Philippe Stark kookiness, it was the furniture designers, it was the hospitality, it was the restaurants that all went into making a scene. Another Paramount. Paramount, the Vermeer headboard, you know, adventures in what you can do with a tiny room to distract people from its tininess. That um, <laughs> incredible headboard. And once again, Ian is a genius at making an image that sort of sells a whole project. And somehow, the combination of that Philippe Stark furniture and that Vermeer headboard was such an incredible image that it really sold that property. From there, we went to the Delano, and they showed us something else. This was these diaphanous white curtains and the white epoxy floors and the rooms, and it felt like something completely different that you'd never seen before. Also, like a moment of surrealism starts entering the vocabulary in a very real way. 
And you know that, yeah. Oh, are we at the Mondrian now? Is that what? Uh, I got my slides all mix, mixed up. Where's the big flower pot? Uh, when the Mondrian came to LA, once again, revolutionary. If any of you had stayed at the old Mondrian, which was kind of great, but towards the end, you know, it was a great place to commit suicide. Um, uh, uh, and working within that shell and adding these incredible, you know, these, these statements, the lobby, the furniture, and I show the pool, not because it's such an amazing design statement, but because it became a scene. It was an attitude, it was the people that you wanted there, it was a buzz, and it was, you know, strangely inclusive. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it brought together uh, people at that time in, in a spirited way that they wanted to gather. Off to Europe for the opening of um, St. Martin's Lane. Is that right, is that the Sanderson? Once again, an image that sells a project. Look, you know, the, this incredible color, this incredible color lighting up, you know, they, at that time, very staid London landscape. It was, it was mind-blowing. And from there, the Sanderson opened very shortly thereafter. Gorgeous picture. Um, and this, the Gramercy Park Hotel was Ian's first project after selling Morgan's Hotel Group. I'm gonna, uh, it marked a shift in ideas and thinking. He worked with Julian Schnabel, which must have been a nightmare. But um, <laughs> it produced a singular vision. And it marked you know, a, a, a shift in popular consciousness away from fashion and design into the art world. The art world that we all, you, Miami, Basel, woo, let's go buy some $100 million paintings. But this was a revolutionary idea to use real artworks, to use an artist, there's a lovely Twombly, um, with that crazy sawtooth thing. Then the public in Chicago, which was another pivot to a much simpler, much more pared down idea of what luxury is and what people bring to it. And oh, John Paulson, residential developments talk about simplicity. Uh, this was the Gramercy Park on Gramercy Park. Um, Herzog and Dimeron. Uh, forget about the Chazerai at the bottom. It's the glass <laughs> that sold this, that that made this a landmark. Look at that image. It, you know, you see it reflecting all these dull brick buildings, all this you know New York grit, and this is like liquescent glass somehow. It was, it, it was an image that, that was incredibly captivating, uh, especially given the context downtown. That's Herzog and Dumeron, we'll keep moving. And I'm gonna end with the London edition so I can get Ian up here. Um, but this, uh, the London edition was, as the French say, succès fou. It was a, a crazy success and it was uh, nestled into these 19th century buildings and using the spirit of those buildings and approaching it in a modern way that acknowledged that beauty, but you know, there, there's that uh, nutty Ingo Maurer egg that just sort of, you know, takes it past well through the 21st century. It's a, it, it was another defining project. And with this gorgeous image, I'm gonna bring Ian up so we can start talking. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Schrager. Tell us <laughs> uh, how, how did you connect with Marriott? You know, I had, I had always done a bunch of one-off projects, custom-made, agonizing over them for two or three years, and you know, making them very special. I had, I had never done anything on a really, really big scale. And I was talking to a lot of big companies about doing something, and I thought that Marriott was the best and the brightest. You know, they're, they're the really only hotel company run by hotel operators. I mean, Bill Murray is a genius, what he's, he's created. And, and we, we, you know, one time he wanted to go to the Gramercy Park Hotel. I happened to be in L.A. on my way, and I flew right back to New York and took him to it. And then and, and I suggested we do something together, and, and we started talking, and we just decided to do something. So, tell me how challenging it was, and perhaps not as challenging as I would think, to have your vision sort of get produced in the, by this much larger organization. Like, how, 
what were the what were the stumbling blocks? What were the what was the uh, the what did what did Marriott bring to the table? Tell me how you you, you realized the first hotels. Well, like any marriage, it had the ups and downs <laughs> in the beginning, but but there were many many more similarities than dissimilarities, and and, and I'm a small entrepreneurial speedboat of a company and they're a big institutional aircraft carrier. You know, as a big company, I've learned they, they can't afford to make mistakes. And 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 I can. You know, I, I, I make a mistake, I pick myself up and dust myself off and, and, and go forward. So there was a bit of a learning curve, but but they were committed to doing something special. And, and, and I was always committed to doing something special and I was a common denominator. And, and because of that, um, uh, it, it, it really was quite easy. I mean, the, the, the media likes to make uh, hay out of this kind of odd bedfellows relationship, but it, it, it wasn't. It was a learning curve a little bit, you know, you know, you know to, to me to get used to the way they do things, they do things differently than I do, and, and, and so on and so forth, but it, it's been, it, it, it's been very fulfilling, and they are committed to doing, you know, groundbreaking, game-changing projects, which is makes me happy. Does does the addition uh, have an overriding sort of sensibility? How would you describe what the addition culture is? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's a kind of very sophisticated, refined. Um, uh, a pared down, you know, elegant look, uh, you know, and, and it, it, it's hard to do simple. Uh, and, and not minimal, uh, can't categorize it, but I think, you know, very visually provocative, with uh, very exciting, very exciting food and beverage concepts, and uh, combining that with um, really, really, really great service. So I, I like to think that Morgan's and Royalton were the kind of prototype for the boutique hotel, the lifestyle hotel that we see you know, all over and everybody running into that space. So I think while everybody else is trying to catch up on the visual end, you know, we like to think we're the best at that, but we're now layering in uh, an element of really great modern service. So you, you don't have to sacrifice anything to stay in the coolest place to come. Get everything you want. And, and and I think that's a way for us to, you know, keep the edge. And that's something that I, you know, can do with Marriott. It, it's not that I wasn't concerned with great service. I was, but I was really more focused on innovating. So to layer in the service with the innovation, I think, you know, makes it, you know, a kind of a one plus one makes three. Uh, to backtrack back to the, you talked about the boutique hotel, which is something that Morgan's established as an idea. And then in the following decade or two, um, you refine that idea across the country. And then slowly it starts moving out into smaller cities. And now the entire country, you go to any medium size small city, there'll be one hotel with a jagged chair and like a fuchsia curtain, and the, the, those are the grandchildren of, of, of the idea that you started. There's completely little resemblance. Do you think about your legacy as far as what these projects do, or are you always just sort of looking forward? Yeah, I don't think about the legacy. Uh, I'm not ready to think about a legacy yet, but, but, but I, I do think about the industry, and, and, I, and I think about that what Steve and I started, lifestyle hotels, um, is the future of the industry. I think people no longer choose a hotel merely because of its location, or merely because of a price point, or merely because they're getting an attractive package. They choose a hotel because they want an elevated experience. They want something unique. They want something special. You know, they, they want something that enhances you know, their vacation or their business trip. And and I think that everybody else in the industry has realized that that's smart. 
um, 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 it's a way of, of, of product distinction, of doing something really unique and special, and everybody's trying to do it. I hope nobody does it to do it. <laughs> I mean, that is the question. People have gotten better following your lead. And, well, and let's talk about West Hollywood. I mean, the scenario is so completely different today than it was when the Montreon came to town. You know, people have upped their game. There are more options, there are more hotels with distinct points of view. Uh, what is going to distinguish uh, the addition uh, West Hollywood? Well, you know, I, I, I think if they, when you do a hotel, you kind of try and mask all the details, and you try and mask them in such a way that a certain alchemy happens, a certain <coughs> magic happens. When, when, when Walt Disney started his animation, um, uh, in, in the 20s and the 30s, those same techniques were available to everybody, but he put it together in a certain way that it resonated with people and, and it was kind of, you know, magical. Uh, and so, you know, I like to think that, you know, we're still doing a hotel, we're still having beds to sell, we're still offering food, we're still offering beverage, but it's a way of putting it together in a kind of viscerally stimulating, magical way that, that I think, I wish somebody else would say this, but I think we do better than, than anybody else. And, and, and I think the difference is that I used to have the market all to myself. I, I don't anymore. So because I don't anymore, it just kind of ups the bar and pushes me and drives me further to continue doing better and better and, 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 and up in the ante a little bit, which is what's interesting for me. How, how extensive is your in-house design team? Very extensive. I mean, not in terms of numbers, but you know, we have a bunch of architects, we have a bunch of designers, and and marketing and graphic people that have been with me for quite some time. It's like a, a big extended family. We, we all think we're doing something really special, like God's work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's just great. It's exhilarating. And, and, you know, so we put, we're so emotionally invested in the project and we want it to be so special um, that it, it, it seems like a big family. Uh, you had such fertile collaborations with Philippe and John Pawson. Uh, who, who are the designers you're excited about working with today? You know, uh, because what, what's happened, it, you know, it's like it, in order to keep moving, I think, you know, we were the first ones that put, uh, used keels and, and, and um, bathroom products uh, from outside sources in the bathrooms. And we were the first one that did uh, fashion designs to the uniforms. Uh, it started with Giorgio Armani and Aberdeen Wire and, and Capricorn. And, and, and we were the first ones that went to designers on, on not the usual suspects to do um, hotels. Now, people are doing that. Everybody's doing that, sir. So it's kind of not interesting for me anymore. So we've taken a lot of the effort in the house because after having been at this for so long, I kind of know what the universal possibilities are. It comes easier to me. And, and we work with some, some architects and designers on the outside that we look for professional um, support from purchasing installations, taking shop doings and things like that, plus working with us and, and, and being on the creative side of it. But I rely very much on the in-house team now. Uh, tell me about the New York edition that just opened. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I haven't been back to New York. It opened, what, a month ago? Well, uh, it was it's open in the clock tower. It's kind of in a new area of New York on 23rd Street, right across the street from Madison Square Park. I think it has extended the boundaries of luxury. Luxury is different now. I think up to now, what hotels, the more traditional looking a hotel was, and the more traditional it was in its approach to luxury, the more luxurious it was considered. Of course, I totally reject that. Things are different, times are different, technology changes, cars change, fashion changes, kitchen appliances changes, everything changes. So the notion of luxury should change. And so we've gone into this new area 
and then done a very refined, sophisticated luxury hotel, but a cool one. And it looks cool. And and it's it's pulsating at night and it's a it's a really hot bar scene and, and I'm just trying to commentate. I kinda of don't go out very much anymore. I have a family and a four year old son. We don't like to go around telling everybody that now, but and and all the people that came to the opening night, even though a lot of them weren't born when the studio was full, but the same people. Same group of people, same feel, same glamour, same excitement. Uh, you know that we that we had there. So gratifying. Do you um, do you feel like when you see all these people who never you know were born, but when, you, when you see this crowd of you know, do you, does it make you feel like I? I could be these people's grandfather, or do you feel like these are my people? What are, like, what are the, what is the spirit? I, I just want to get more to the attitude and spirit, the glamour, well, you know, what, what is it that makes it so exciting? Everything's about the product. The only thing that matters. You know, what it goes to show you is that if you, if you, I think people expected a special product, and, and, and they got it. And, and, and it, it, it's the product, it's the distinctiveness and uniqueness of the product. It, it's the outside the box thinking. It, 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 it's giving people something that's an alternative to what's currently available in the marketplace. It, 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 and, and, and people gravitate towards that. They gravitated towards it 35 years ago and they still gravitate towards it. It's like, um, it's hard to define. I can't put a label on it. I can't write a book about it. I just know it when I see it. And I think everybody knows when they're in a special place and knows when there's a kind of excitement in the air. And it, 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 it's special. And, it, and, it, and it's different in a place that just hires a designer and spends millions on finishes and, and details. It, it, it's just different because it just doesn't come together and that spark doesn't happen. Uh, you know, I won't ask you about specific projects that you've worked on, but did those sparks ever not come together? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was I, I, you know, I, I, it's a pain, stage, it's like giving birth. I, I, I wouldn't have opened uh, until it was, um, it was, it was special, and it was step by step by step, layer upon layer upon layer, until it, until it, 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 it right. And, and, and I don't know anything about hotel development. What are the major pieces that need to come together? There's obviously the money, there's, there's the food service. Like, what are the pieces that must come together uh, in order for one, of the, for one of your hotels to come to life? Well, first, there's a whole acquisition, you know, yeah. component. It's quite complicated, and uh, usually hotels are very capital intensive, so it requires institutional financing, and, and those are all necessary evils that you have to kind of deal with. It's not the part of the thing I enjoy, <laughs> but it's a necessary evil in order to get to the project, which is what I what I do enjoy. Then it's just kind of creating an experience. Um, creating the public space and bringing in the food and beverage collaborators and, and kind of aligning our interests so what they do is good for them but it's also good for the hotel uh, and bringing in other recreational things and then doing the room which is always the most challenging it's always the most challenging for me to do the room because it's a very finite space it's kind of always very difficult to do something in a kind of very finite space that's unique and different and um, and also it's a place where a lot of intimate things happen, bathing, sleeping, eating, and, 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 and so it, it's not tolerant of any mistakes. Where the public space is more um, predicated upon flamboyant gestures, showbiz. Um, the, the, the room has to function like a machine and then still feel good. So we do it opposite. You know, when most people, when they do a hotel, they do the public space first, and the room is kind of afterthought. We don't do it that way. We do the room first. And when we're comfortable with the room, 
then we <coughs> in public place. And working overseas, and, and, and mm -hmm. as you said, you've got projects all over the world now. Is it trickier to make that vision come to life when you're working in in places where you know the contractors they build differently, the you know the people have a different thought? Have you had sort of difficulties culture-wise, or are we just seeing so increasingly international that the only place that's difficult is China? And we're a guest in this city. We're doing the hotel. We want the people of that city to embrace us. If they don't, it can't be successful. We want to kind of manifest that place. We want people, if they go to a city, to stay in a hotel that feels like the city that they're visiting, which is one of the things that was wrong with the industry when I got there, like same hotel in Boston, same hotel in West Hollywood, same hotel in Manhattan. No, terrible. And it doesn't take, even when I go into a strange city, it's like a couple of days and I got the feel for it, and I know, I know, I don't know what it is. Um, China is different because it's changing so fast. It's not going to be the same two years from now. So it's kind of a moving target to try and hit the bullseye capture the essence of that city because the people are changing and there, 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 there are new classes are emerging so that's complex but any other city I can get my arms around it in, 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 in two couple of days and what what balance is there of, of residential development like the two or 215 Christie uh, what percentage of your work is focused on that and what percentage hospitality I'm just curious. Residential is an easy business for me. When you finish building it, you're open. You're done. You know, with a hotel, when you finish building it, your work starts. It's a kind of living, breathing business. I love the idea of residential with a hotel. It, it, this country doesn't have a tradition of service departments. They do in Asia, they do in Europe. So living in a hotel provided it has its own separate entrance and you have your privacy and you know, you, you, you know you, and you, you're not sharing the space with transient people um it's just great i mean you get everything you want it's like you know, a dream you know you, you can have a housekeeper you don't even have to have them there all day long you can have them there for two hours you can have a water bottle put in your bed at night you can have your bed it's just it's just a dream so I love this idea of living on top of our hotel, and when it's appropriate, you know, we do it. But I'm in a hotel business. That's, that, that's my business. That's, that's the part that I, I enjoy more. Um, because when I do a residence, I have to do an envelope. It's not my personality that's supposed to come out in the residence. It's the, the person who's going to live there. So I have to provide an envelope that's suitable and receptive to whatever style that person has. In a hotel, that's my idea, and I'm hoping that people buy off the of it, that they like it, that they it hits the zeitgeist, that, 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 that part of that, it's writing that, that social collective unconsciousness that, that people respond to, and I kind of enjoy trying to, to hit that moving target. So. Well, I think I said something about you, <laughs> one wrote something that many times I've written about you, about your uncanny ability to kind of surf that zeitgeist and understand like the world is more interested in art now, the world. Uh, how, how do you need, this is an intuitive process or is there some sort of, you know, do you, do you, do you is there research or is it uh, just much more your travels in the world and absorbing the particular spirit of different places? You know, I think outside the box, I, I see things other people can't see. Um, I read everything I can get my hands on. I'm a, I, I love popular culture. I'm curious about everything. I, I get a feeling for what, for what you know, 
what people are beginning to react to. I get it by seeing the way they react to other forms of popular culture. It's like a signpost to me. I, I, I get a, I try and connect the dots of, 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 um, of what I'm seeing. If I see skirt limbs go up or down, I question why is that happening? Um, if I see certain colors worn or by, 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 I see if, if, for, for, if a couple of, several years ago there were two Supreme Court justices that came out of uh, Minneapolis and Prince came out of Minneapolis, I was thinking, what's going on in Minneapolis over there? <laughs> so, it's just that, and it's totally instinctive. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to wrap things up with a very tricky question. Is the West Hollywood edition going to be the greatest edition of them all? <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, to me, what drives me is keep out doing, doing myself. I mean, to me, I think West Hollywood, uh, along with New York, uh, you know, very, very, very important um, cities for me. I, I, I was lucky enough to be here during the first renaissance yep. of um, West Hollywood when we did the monument. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm lucky again to be part of uh, another renaissance. You know, we, when, I, when we were doing West Hollywood, I, I, you know, I wanted to hire John Pawson. John Pawson lives in London. You know, my partner was anxious about that. He wanted to hire an LA designer, not that they weren't great designers out here, but you know, we were willing to underwrite the treachery because we wanted to do a spectacular. Best hotel in, in West Hollywood, best hotel in Southern California, hopefully the best hotel in California. You know, game changing. Um, people take note. People come to West Hollywood, must see West Hollywood, must see the addition, you know, West Hollywood. Or else, I wouldn't bother. I think that's a fine note to end on.